Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name's Paul, Paul Taylor Mills. I'm the artistic director here at The Other Palace. Um, the Other Palace, we are here and we're going to be presenting uh, fully produced musicals and alongside the fully presented musicals, we're also going to be doing some extracurricular activities, which is our initiatives. Um, those initiatives are designed to inspire, educate and to give artists who really want to work in new musicals an opportunity to uh, work on those musicals. Um, tonight is the very first live at the Other Palace. Uh, and I'm absolutely honoured to be here, uh, not only because I ran 26 miles today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, also tonight is really, really special because it's an absolute honour to uh, welcome two people to the stage who have been instrumental to my career. Um, first of all, please uh, help me in welcoming Andrew Lloyd Webber to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to the other palace. Um, well, this is a fantastic uh, excitement for me because I guess it was February two years ago, mm. just really about February two years ago, that I went to see Hamilton for the first time at the Public Theatre in, uh, in New York. And I, I left thinking that for the really the first time, really in the 50 odd years that I've been working in musical theatre, that I'd seen something completely different, completely new, completely original, and that it was a tone of voice. I just sort of celebrated. I, I could, did, really didn't know what to say. So I did something which I've never, ever done in my life before, and have only once done since. I tweeted. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just said exactly that. And uh, I, I cannot tell you, therefore, what a joy it is to bring Lynn on in a moment. I just want to tell you one thing, which is why Paul's here that I've only ever been in conversation once before, and it was with Putin. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you, may, you may wonder why this was, but the thing was is that some years ago, I got myself conned by the BBC into doing the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to the BBC, look, I'll do this, providing I can get an interview with Putin about the Eurovision Song Contest. And the BBC said, no way can you get this. So I rang up his sidekick, a guy called Dmitry Peshkov, and uh, I said I'd like an interview with Putin, what well, he was Prime Minister at the time, about the Eurovision Song Contest. And I got it. <laughs> and so uh, after, I, it was the most scary thing I've ever, ever been through in my life. <laughs> he, he had these six dogs, which he had around. <laughs> A huge great dogs and sort of bored me with his pale blue eyes. <laughs> so after that I decided that a career as an interviewer was not a good idea. <laughs> so I thought Paul could help me out today and with the questions. But anyway, I'd like you to welcome that the most exciting person who to have merged in musical theatre, in my view, in fifty years, Lynn Manuel Miranda. <laughs> Well, they seem to like you anyway. That's I, don't, I don't know how to follow that introduction. <laughs> I can't possibly live up to it. Well, we can't really. I was going to ask you that the, <laughs> the, the corny question, which I suppose I just have to, because somebody else will if I don't. But why on earth did you get involved with musicals as opposed to writing songs and pop songs and all that? Oh, well, uh, yeah, that's a great place to start. Um, and I'm going to ask you the same question. Now, no way should you think this is a one-way interview. Oh, I, I, I got I, questions. I was going to leave it to Paul and go home. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, I, I, I was very lucky to go to an elementary school where the capstone of elementary school, Hunter College Elementary School in New York City, and um, the sixth graders would do a musical every year. That was sort of the summation of your year. And so, and the whole school goes. So I remember seeing musicals as a part of school, like here are the first graders and we're going to see the sixth graders do Fiddler on the Roof. And in kindergarten we saw West Side Story. And, <laughs> you know, it, yeah. And um, <laughs> by the time we got to sixth grade, our brilliant music teacher, Barbara Ames, had run out of age appropriate musicals for us to do. This is before the R&H Junior series existed. She was doing bootleg versions of her own stuff. And so we did 20 minute versions 
of the previous six years worth of musicals. So it was this lethal dosage. I played a son in Fiddler. I played an Out of Pearl backup in The Wiz. I played <laughs> Captain Hook, Bernardo, uh, and most importantly, I played uh, Conrad Birdie. Um, and I was 12 years old and three feet tall, and <laughs> every girl in the grade had to pretend to be in love with me <laughs> and faint when I sang, <laughs> and I said, I'm doing this now. <laughs> uh, and that was it. I mean, I, 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 and I grew up loving, you know, I grew up, uh, my parents loved Men of La Mancha and Camelot, and I saw Phantom in sixth grade, and I went, oh, this is about a songwriter who needs music to get girls to like him. This is about me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yep. so that was very <laughs> formative. In fact, I auditioned for the sixth grade play with Music of the Night, up three octaves, because I was still a soprano at the time. <laughs> Puberty had not yet struck. <laughs> so that's how you do it. So it was literally at school. Yeah, it was at school. And I mean, that's really why it's so important that we keep music in, in, in our schools. Because it's... <laughs> yeah. It changed a lot. What about you? Well... I mean, it was, a, it was a funny because, of course, you see, musicals when I started in sort of 1910 uh, <laughs> were, were, were really not, and you know, they're not part of the DNA as they are in America. So I guess when I, when I started, I mean, if you said you liked Rodgers and Hammerstein, people looked at you as if you were another, from another planet. And I, I, I remember that, you know, every, everybody either wanted to be a beetle or, or a stone or whatever, but... I kind of said, I, I like musicals, and people looked at you as if you were really rather curious. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I was kind of plowing quite a, a lonely furrow, really. Yeah. But funnily enough, though, the, the first piece of mine that ever really got started was Joseph and Amazing Totally Kind of Dreamcoat, and that was written for a school. Oh, wow. And uh, although it wasn't staged, it was written as a kind of cantata, you know, and it was, of course, telling history in a new way, which I suppose brings us on to... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. Well, well, I mean, and that's really our, our shared DNA here, because when I first read Ron's biography of Hamilton, at the end of the second chapter, when I realized, oh, this is... Hip-hop's the only way to tell this guy's life story, um, I said, well, then I'm, th I'm about to get my Andrew Lloyd Webber on. Um, <laughs> I will do a concept album, and I'll have rappers play the founders. And, and then the fun for me, in re I mean, in reading the book for the first time, I mean, I, I didn't even know the history at this point, was I'd get to George Washington and how Ron described him. i go, okay, so that's like common. Um, and I was casting <laughs> rappers and R&B artists as the founders. Like, who is the vocal fit in my conception of this? Um, even in the first time reading through it. And so, but in my head, I was, I was going to do what you did, which was make this amazing concept album and have everyone who listens to it be like, when is this going to be a stage play? Um, which is sort of what happened. But well, well we, we um, Tim Rice, I, is Tim Rice here? I think he might be tonight. What? Uh, <laughs> Hi. Uh, <laughs> Just another sir <laughs> in the second row. Uh, but we s uh, sort of really were forced to do it because nobody would put our show on stage. Nobody thought the musical about Jesus Christ was at all a good idea. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and in fact, they thought we were terminally insane. Uh, but we recorded a single of it, mm -hmm. which was just called Superstar, and it got a bit of sort of traction around the world in one or two places. And as a consequence of that, the record company said, well, okay, you can have the money to make the album. So it was kind of the other way round. So you did it through the record system. So we did through the record system almost by mistake because nobody would, um, nobody would stage it. That's, that's interesting to me because I remember thinking as I was writing it, you know, how did, how did you get like the lead singer of Deep Purple and these like established rock artists like on your concept album where it's like, I didn't know any rappers. Like, I didn't know how to get the people I had in my head. I mean, thinking back on it, I think record companies were far more open yeah. to... Uh, I mean, Tim Russ and I were unknown at the time completely, but I think they were sort of far more open to the idea. And in fact, Murray Head, who played Judas on the original album, had worked with Tim Rice at EMI uh, when uh -huh. Tim was working there. And so we managed to put together a cast, and Ian Gillan was a new member of Deep Curve Purple at the time. Right. And there was all this good business going on about rock fusion. Um, Deep Purple wrote a symphony uh, mm -hmm. for rock band and orchestra, which I don't know whatever happened with. But I mean, it, it was 
it was around, uh -huh. and it was a kind of time when the Stones, you know, had the bar choir on, you know, right. singles and things, and, and so everything was all coming together in a in a very different way now. But um, I, I mean, it's the other way around to, to Hamilton because, I mean, you you were developing Hamilton for a long while. Yeah, right? yeah, I started writing that song in 2008. I was on my first vacation yeah. uh, from In the Heights when I um, when I read that book. Um, but that's also, again, that's really fascinating to me because you're sort of describing a time when rock was branching out into other genres of music and you kind of met well, it from the other end. Everything was allowed. It yeah. really didn't matter. Yeah. You could take instruments from anywhere. Um, I mean, the more you mix, the right. more than you mix and match, the yeah. better. And I've been this guy who's like, hip hop belongs on Broadway, hip hop belongs on Broadway. It's just kind of, you know, like the, the guy on the corner holding a <laughs> sign. Um, <laughs> And for a long time, um, because I just I, I feel like the the things I love about hip hop are also the things I love about my favorite musicals in terms of how you tell story and how you characterize those things and how much you can pack into a lyric. Um, and so um, so yeah, so I you know I, I kind of had to write the show in order to make the album. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I went around it, it backwards. Completely the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Completely. Completely. But the thing was, of course, we were we we had to therefore stick to the album because the album was so well known right. particularly in America that we couldn't really change anything and sometimes I know that Tim and I both wonder whether that was really a good thing because it meant that a director couldn't say could you add another 24 right. bars here for a scene change or whatever yeah it, it, so it became the piece that's an inter but another interesting thing we share because we also weirdly had public gestations of our show. I mean, you have yeah. the album, which exists and is well known before you ever stage it for Jesus Christ Superstar. And I performed the first song at the White House. Um, and as one does. As one does. <laughs> uh, because uh, we had been, you know, the Obamas had just been elected. They, they invited me to perform something from In the Heights. They said, unless you have something about the American experience. And I went. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just started doing this, and uh, I, I sent it to Stan Lathan was the producer of the evening, and uh, he I sent him the lyrics, and he because I didn't have the music yet, I had been writing to a beat I had I had created in GarageBand, and uh, he he wrote back, oh you're closing, um, you're going to be the closing number of of our night, uh, so I call Alex and was like we have to translate this beat I made to a piano, and uh, and performed it uh, at the White House, and then. You know, it went well in the room, and then it went, well, the, the good luck of it was HBO film that evening, because they had poets yeah, that yeah. were participating. So the footage of it doesn't look like C-SPAN footage of a White House yeah. event. It looks like I'm starring in some weird movie about my life, <laughs> about the time I got to perform for the Obamas. And it's true, if you ever made a movie about my life, you would just cut to that footage. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, so then that became, that had its own life, this one song, just like Superstar. That song... That started it. That started it, and I worked on other projects, but I was, um, I had that song out in the world, and if you look at the YouTube comments, it would always be, my teacher showed us this. We saw this in class. Oh, okay. yeah, and so yeah. I knew, we'll be fine with school groups. <laughs> <laughs> like, this show, will, this show will be fine with school groups, and like, I should finish writing it. And I was working at the glacial pace of a song a year. Um, so I, at, in 2010, when I had two songs to show for all my work, Tommy Kale, being the smarter one in our relationship, said, let's start setting deadlines. And so we just started <laughs> staging concerts. So the, first time anyone heard any other songs were at, at Lincoln Center. We, he was like, they've offered us Alexander Hamilton's birthday, you're gonna write a, as many songs as you can, that's the deadline, and I had six months and I wrote 11 I songs. I mean, how many incarnations did you have of it in workshop? Um, it, pretty fast as musicals go. I mean, it was, it was the Lincoln Center workshop for which I wrote 11 songs, and, and I got a great piece of advice from John Weidman, who, who you know, writes with yeah. Sondheim a lot, because I was drowning in the research. You know, you can write 50 musicals about Hamilton and never touch on the same thing. Um, and John Weidman said, stop worrying about it, getting everything, just write the parts you think are a musical. Um, and so for that concert, that's exactly what I did. I wrote The Affair, I wrote, the, you know, had the opening number, I had The Affair, I had Hamilton first getting to New York, I wrote two cabinet battles, I actually wrote a third one that, did, that no one's heard, um, that didn't make it because it wasn't quite good enough. Um, and I wrote Helpless. Satisfied didn't exist yet because I was still on the fence as to whether Angelica would be a character in the story or not. Um, 
And yeah, I'm glad I went the way I did. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so yeah, so, but that ended up forming sort of a spine. And then I went, and then the next incarnation was Vassar, where I wrote Act One. And then we had a bunch of internal um, readings. Actually, there was a version where there were dialogue scenes between the yeah, songs. Yeah, that's, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, we worked with a really great playwright who will remain unnamed, <laughs> um, but who wrote these beautiful dialogue scenes where, you know, it would be talk, 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 helpless, talk, 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 satisfied, and it didn't work because the opening number is what it is. Well, I was going to ask you that because you know, listening to it again on the way here, um, I, I thought, you couldn't possibly follow that number with dialogue. Yeah, you can't be like, hey, let's go to the bar. Like, it doesn't, yeah. like, <laughs> when, when it's such heightened speech at the yeah. top, it just, yeah. the ball falls. And so what ends up happening is the inverse, we have the inverse rule of musicals, which, you know, the standard trope they tell you is you talk, and when it's too heightened, you sing, and when it's even more heightened, you dance. Now, in our show, you only talk when it's super important. There's two dialogue scenes in the whole show. It's... Um, Hamilton meeting Eliza, it's Lauren's dying, and oh, and the third one is Hamilton's soliloquy at the end, um, and that's sort of the only time we don't have any music playing. I, but I remember years ago um, when I first met, I was lucky enough to meet Richard Rogers uh, just after Superstar came out, and um, he asked me, I mean, I mean, I obviously was itching to ask him questions like, I mean, what was it like working with Hammerstein compared with Hart and all those sort of things, but the only thing he wanted to know was, did I think that the through sung musical was going to be the future? <laughs> and, I, I mean, it, it's extraordinary, really, because I remember saying to him, I think it's horses for courses. I mean, certain shows, I think you do, you've got to have dialogue. Absolutely. But I think there are, I mean... Of course, I like the idea of, as a composer, being in control of the evening. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. <laughs> and, and it kind of works. Yeah, I yeah. and then, you know, when we, when we sort of reached the decision, when we did that one reading where there were dialogue scenes, you know, it, it was about two, three days of Tommy and I not calling each other, which is very weird, because we call each other when we've had breakfast. Um, <laughs> and the first thing we said to each other was, why does it feel like we stepped sideways from when we just did 11 songs in a row? Why does it feel like a step back from that? And it was, there's nothing wrong with the scenes, it's just this is not meant to have dialogue. Um, and it meant a lot more work for me, because I was really counting on being like, all right, you take this section, I'll write a song for this. You know, there is a fun in, in, in going back and forth with another writer. I really enjoy that part of the process, but it just didn't make sense uh, for this story be because of the way we'd set it up. But it's kind of interesting because Rogers was talking to me about the through song musical and everything. And I suppose the question that a lot of people would ask you is, do you feel your, you yourself will ever write outside of hip hop? Oh, yeah. I mean, all the time. I, I, I think that's, um, for me, the, the insight in, in seeing Hamilton as a story was, this is a story hip hop's uniquely suited to tell. Because of the narration. Of because the of the narration, because yeah. of the sheer amount of events in his life, and yeah. because Hamilton as a person, every major event in his life is marked by writing. And to me, yeah. my favorite hip-hop MCs are the ones who write their, you know, just write incredibly, and they write narratives about their own lives or, or sort of these characters that they create around themselves. And I thought Hamilton created himself, and he created himself through his writing, and that's what MCs do. Um, and so that was, you know, it was just sort of, this story is, is suited to my skill set. Um, yeah. And like in, and it, the book just kept proving me right as I was reading. And I was like, oh, he wrote under pseudonyms. Oh, what, who does that? Rappers do that. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 <laughs> oh, his, his, his disagreements with Jefferson like created a two-party system. Like it was just everything. Um, just, it kept proving my thesis. Um, and so that was, you know, but th at the same time, like you fall in love with what you fall in love with. And the story tells you what it wants to sound like. I mean, don't you find that's the case is that, yeah. You know, yes. like I when you're sitting down to write Evita, um, like <laughs> when, <laughs> what does it occur? Like where where does that start in terms well of well? It's like always the a question, a isn't it? I mean, whether you adopt to what extent you become a chameleon and you adopt the style yeah. of the show that you're actually writing. And I I I tend to do that myself, but um, which people sometimes say, well, that means he's got no style. But right. uh, I, I, I do try and get under the skin of the story that I'm doing. Because I think probably one of the things that Hamilton triumphantly shows us 
is, is that a great story is vital. I mean, I've come to the conclusion now that uh, you can have uh, a great score and a bad story, and the great score can't necessarily carry it. Right. But you can ha have a, a not terribly good score and a great story, uh, and it'll work. I think a great story is vital. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. Yeah, the, um, in terms of just, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, my brain is doing a Rolodex of your shows, and I'm trying to think where to even put my finger down to ask you. Um, Starlight Express. Starlight <laughs> Express. <laughs> Um, no, no, I was going to ask, I was actually going to ask about, um, <laughs> I was going to ask about Phantom, um, because you get to play in all the, I mean, it couldn't be more different from Superstar, but you also get to, like, mess around with opera and, like, crazy atonal opera. And those who measure went on one! Oh, well, that's just, yes. Well, <laughs> yeah. That's a little conceit there, because uh, my idea with the Phantom was, is that he wrote music that was not of his time. So he started playing with the atonal scale, right. which you triumphantly performed there. Which is more than <laughs> it sometimes is, I have to say. <laughs> um, but but that, was the, that was the thought there. Uh, and he also plays in 7 8 time from time to time. Hey, we, 7 8 we, we, time. We all love here. We love it. Yeah. Um, I have one song in Hamilton that is just my little secret love letter to Andrew Lloyd Webber. That's like <laughs> the <laughs> only rap in 7 8. And it's right after the first duel. Uh, number 10, pace is fire, and suddenly we're in seven for just a second. And it's like, Bur uh, uh, Lee, do you yield? You shot him in the side. Yes, he yields. I'm satisfied. Yo, we got to clear the field. Go, we won. Here comes a general. This should be fun. What is the meaning of this? Mr. Burr, get a medic for the general. Yes, sir. Lee, you will never agree with me, but these men don't. Yeah, it's fine. Good. <laughs> and, then I, and then I get to, I survived it for about, 40 bars, and I was like, meet me inside. Back to eight, back to eight, back to eight, back to eight. <laughs> but you well, know, it's, I don't know if you're aware of this, but like in music theory class now, if you're teaching seven, eight, Andrew Lloyd Webber's the mnemonic. It's like, how do I count seven, eight? Can you touch, can you heal me? Christ, you must be the high priest. Dun, dun, dun. That's how I count seven, eight in my head. <laughs> well, you can do seven, eight masses of different ways. So it's a, I, I just think it's a great fun time signature because you know you yeah. can don't. Go you never know where that rhyme is going to land. You never know. <laughs> no, you never do. Well, look, I think we should throw it open to Let's the floor. I've, I've, I've actually got I've some questions. Enough. We're we're live on Facebook, everybody, at the moment. Hey, uh, like, 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 love, <laughs> cry face. <laughs> um, Daisy Edmondson, and I'd actually love to ask this question. This is for both of you. Can success become a straitjacket? And what happens when you have a, a Phantom and a Hamilton? Andrew, first of all, to you. You first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess, uh, look, I, I can, uh, you can answer it in several ways. I think one of the things, and I'm sure you would agree, is, is that we're very lucky that we're doing the one thing that we love. And uh, I, therefore, don't really, it, it sounds a silly answer this, but I don't really care in one sense. I, I, I mean, after I did uh, Phantom, I did a musical called Aspects of Love, which was about a, a small number of people, and it was so different, it, and because I just wanted to do that. And I think providing that you stay true to the writing what you want to write, and, and I, I, I don't think it is necessarily a straitjacket, but of course it can be. I mean, I, I remember one thing um, um, as I'm foolishly writing my autobiography at the moment. What? And, uh, I, and I, came, uh, I came across something which I'd completely forgotten about, which was that I was the cover story on t of Time magazine in 1984. And I remember thinking, when I, at the time, and I got my notes on this, thinking, I don't need this. I really, really don't need this. I'm, I'm a Brit. I'm not part of um, the Broadway community. It's going to make things very difficult for me. And I remember thinking then uh, that, it, yeah, it can be a bit of a straitjacket. But I think providing you stay true to what yourself and what you want to write, and you write next what you actually want to write, uh, rather than what you think you should write, then I think... Was there a clear a moment for you where you thought, wow, my life is never going to be the same again? Was there a, a show or a moment where you thought, wow... I don't know. I, I sort of so much just love musical theatre. It never sort of occurred to me that there was anything different mm. much. I mean, it's quite interesting, going back to something we, we were talking about earlier, but it, it's, I suppose what it's your first memory of what theatre really sticks with you, doesn't it? I mean, I remember when I was a kid that there was a show on, on British television called Oh Boy, and it was a pop rock show uh, directed by a guy called Jack Good, who did the Rock Othello, among various other things. 
and it was done from the old Hackney Empire. And it was rock performers, British rock performers, but staged in an old Victorian theatre. And I was like nine years old, and I thought, that's what musical theatre is. In exactly the same way as I thought Rodgers and Hammerstein were musical theatre, or West Side Story was musical theatre. And I, we were talking about that earlier. You have a very similar... Well, yeah, I mean, I d I've been, I'm always just drawn to music that tells stories. And so genre is fluid. Genre is what clothes the person wears to the gig and what instruments they use. But a good melody is a good melody. Good beat's a good beat. A good story is a good story. That's universal and that transcends. Um, and so I, you know, I, I grew up, I grew up sort of a, just a little younger than hip hop, you know? Hip hop was being invented in the South Bronx in the late 70s, and I was born just below it uh, in 1980. So it was just never not a part of my life. Um, yeah. Whereas I think, yeah. you know, f for some folks, it, you know, and, and it, it's crazy that a hip hop musical um, that has been, because there's been tons of hip hop musicals. Lizzie Suedos was playing with hip hop in musicals in 1978 in Runaways, and that won Best Musical. Um, but in terms of like a full composed thing, like, this should have happened 30 years ago. Um, but for me, it's, um, I, just, I just always love stories. I love music that tells stories, and that was always Lynn, the thing that blows my mind is how do you, after Hamilton, A, what do you do next, and B, how do you keep your humility and your feet absolutely on the ground? Well, um, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a two very concrete there answers to that. Um, one is my, my son was born three weeks before we started rehearsal for Hamilton. Mm. So I was, <laughs> I was being, I was like really not sleeping, you guys. <laughs> and also my wife was being an absolute superhero because she was, she was doing the late night stuff and the hard stuff when I was writing the duel. Um, <laughs> and, and so, you know, they keep me very humble and they keep me very grounded. Um, and, and I'm just, I, I guess I'm very grateful that it happened uh, at this point. I'd, I'd had a musical that had success, like we won Best Musical. That's about as big as you can get in Broadway yeah. parlance. And, uh, and it didn't change my life that much, except that like every once in a while in my neighborhood, people would be like, Usnavi! Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Vanessa always says, you know, it was, my success at that point was like just being like a pretty girl in New York. Like every once in a while, someone will just yell something at you. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Vanessa's like, I've been pretty all my life, so this, we're like on the same <laughs> level. Um, and, and then the other thing is, you know, I think, uh, I, I was a bi I'm a big film buff, and one of my favorite books growing up was uh, Rebel Without a Crew by Robert Rodriguez, who very famously made his debut film for $8,000. He sold all his blood, he maxed out all his credit cards, and he makes this movie. Uh, and it's his calling card to Hollywood, and then he just... You know, everyone's worried about sophomore slump. I was like, well, this is my sophomore project, so that's handled. And, and two, um, just do so many things that no one knows what your next project is. Mm -hmm. So he went and directed a thing for Cinemax, and he directed a segment of Four Rooms, and, and I sort of have been taking that advice. I was like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna just sort of wait to fall in love with whatever the next idea is, because you have to be in love yeah. with your yeah. musical idea. It's gonna be several years of your life and it's got to yeah. sustain that relationship. That's what people forget, is how long it does take to develop a musical. Yeah. And uh, I, I, you can just rush in. I mean, I've made mistakes sometimes just because I just so enjoy working, mm -hmm. of going and doing something, because I think, yeah, I can see a theatrical thing. And in, in fact, the story isn't really totally right. Uh -huh. So I, I, I think you're absolutely right, absolutely right. So you're not in a straitjacket. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not, we'll see. We've got <laughs> one here from um, Emma. What do you think is the reason for the new voices in musicals at the moment with Hamilton, La La Land, Dear Evan Hansen? I like there is a new voice <laughs> I now. think we just answered that question because you said new voices. All those projects started like 10 yeah. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. that's, that's the f I mean, that's the thing. They take a long time. Mm. To get them right, they take a really long time. You know, La La Land was Damien's passion project. He wanted to make that movie before he made Whiplash. Um, you know, uh, Dear Evan Hansen, uh, you know, Ask and Paul have been around for a really well, long time. That's been in development that's for been a while, That's been developed for a really it? long time. Yeah. And those guys are amazing and have continued to just sort of work on the thing and, and get it to where it is. Um, I, I, the more I hear, s uh, the more I see new shows and shows on that level of quality, the more I think it's all about passion and it's all about what you care about. You know, 
Tom Kitt and Brian Yorkie wrote Next to Normal. They started writing that at Columbia. Um, you know, that was the thing that was, that was their show. And, and they worked on it and worked on it and worked on it. And, it's, and it has to sustain you because you're not promised anything. You're not promised an opening night. You're not promised uh, an advanced sale. Like, you can't control the outcome or the success of the thing. So you have to be able to say, if this closes tomorrow, I will have learned something from this process. I will have something yeah. I am proud of. You have to be able to sort of point it at the end of the day. And so that's, that's sort of the million dollar question mm. is, is, is picking those things that sustain you. Mm. And bef before we go out to the room, I've just got one question. Um, and this is, this is me being a bit naughty actually. I'll probably get fired tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but I um, obviously, Andrew, Starlight Express was the first musical to feature rap. No way! What was the first musical? No, what was the first musical to feature rap? Do we know? Well, it depends on how you define it. Sondheim would tell you Rock Island, right. uh, and Music Man is 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 uh, is an ancestor to rap. I don't know that that's necessarily well, true. Here, here we have a review from Starlight Express from Charles Spencer. Charles Spencer was one of the number one leading critics. I hope you don't I mind. Oh, reading I, reviews I, I, are I wonderful. I'd rather, rather do mind <laughs> you. <laughs> Um, it, this is uh, Starlight been running for a while. Do we have to go here? I think so. <laughs> um, uh, is everybody ready? The great thing about Starlight Express at the Apollo Victoria is just how wonderful it feels when it stops. The downside is that you feel it never will. Um, it, it goes on, it goes on. Um, Lloyd Webber has added insult to injury with a rap number, the most obnoxious form of music ever invented. <laughs> it's real. This was a real that, review. That's, yes, I remember that now. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes. <laughs> but it's really nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> this was in 1992. Yeah. And how much everything's changed now. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to take some questions from the room. <laughs> and, we are. Um, and I think I'm going to delete this. <laughs> Who's out there? Hello. We have just one just here. Kylie's making her way to you. Passing the mic, passing the mic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Lynn Manuel, this is a question for you. So um, I actually saw Hamilton in New York and I'm seeing it in London in, in January because it takes that long, I guess. <laughs> but um, my question for you is you were mentioning in the beginning how when you were reading Ron Chernow's biography, you kind of saw it the rappers who you wanted to play the characters. So after Hamilton came out, obviously you had the remix to right. the soundtrack. So how did that feel and how did that correlate to what you were expecting when you were first started? I mean, it, honestly, it was like fantasy camp for me. I mean, it was, t what was incredible was the show became a magnet for the hip hop community, which is really what I wanted to happen. I mean, I, I, all my dreams came true within the Heights. I went from, broke substitute teacher to Broadway composer. Like, that's the biggest leap I'll ever make in my life. I'll never make a leap that big in my life again. Um, that being said, so, but it, In the Heights never really landed with the hip-hop community, even though there was a lot of hip-hop in it, just because those circles are just this far apart. Um, and so to have the hip-hop community come and Busta Rhymes come to the show and sit in the front row like this, <laughs> and that, you know, who was m in my head as Hercules Mulligan, you know, I, I put the demo, I put my first demo of my shot on SoundCloud, and you can hear me doing a bad Busta Rhymes impression. <laughs> <laughs> Hercules Mulligan! <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, Common was, was like in my head as George Washington, is how, that's how Washington raps. And also, that was the fun parlor game for me, of like matching flows to different characters. Just the way you'd match a different musical melodic motif to a character, I was, I was doing that with the characters as well. So it's just sort of another thing to add in the mix. Um, and then getting to work with those artists was just a dream come true. And I was sort of the newbie on that side, you know, watching Joel Ortiz record a verse who is, you know, an insanely gifted rapper and learning things that I would never learn because I'm a songwriter who works at a piano. Like watching a rapper do their own hype track. What is a hype track? Whenever you hear a rapper, you'll always hear just like this little echo of their own voice over their own voice. Um, and, and watching him do the thing, one take, like wonder, and then watching him just punch the rhymes and just say that, you know, and so it gets that incredible feeling when you hear it, and when you hear the album of like, you know, just this was like the thing is that I, I couldn't have learned except but to work on mixtape. So it, it was like a dream come true for me. It was like learning the other side of this art form I love so much. So it was 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hello. One from down here. Hola, ¿qué tal? Hola. <laughs> Muy contenta de estar aquí. I'm very happy to be here. Um, mainly is a question for you, Lynn. Um, very naughty as well. Um, if you can choose a musical from Andrew that you wish you have written, which one it will be? <laughs> or <laughs> or Ooh. that you wish that you could translate in Spanish as you did for What's Side Story uh, Wow. Well, my answer... <laughs> <laughs> My answer to both is Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, well, I actually, the thing is, there's an amazing translation of Jesus Christ Superstar. There's a Camilo Sesto recording of Jesus Christ Superstar that I love because it's the Spain Spanish. So it's got the theta in it, which I think really works for Judas. You know, it's empieza a creer lo que dicen de ti. I love that. Uh, and, um, but I love Jesus Christ Superstar. I think it's just, it's just beginning to end. Yeah, and, and I was telling Andrew before, you have no idea how many rappers I talk to about Jesus Christ Superstar <laughs> because it's just hooks and hooks and hooks for days. Like every song, um, you could take the bass part and make a rap song out of it. Like it's just so, uh, I, I'm, don't do that. I'm, that's my idea. Do not <laughs> take that. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, you know, and I played Jesus in college. Um, freshman year, so that one's like very close to my heart. Um, in fact, there was a, I had a guest, I, the, the first thing I told you when you came to see Hamilton yes. was I had a Gethsemane reference that I cut yes, in very previews. It, <laughs> <laughs> and you said, what? Put it back! Yeah. <laughs> um, it was, it was, I imagine death so much it feels more like a memory. Is this where it gets me? On my feet, several feet ahead of me. Um, oh no, it was, uh, Uh, this is where it gets me. On my feet, several feet ahead of me. And it was, um, there was a, it was in the Garden of Gethsemane, beckoning. Slip for just a second, gave my enemies a weapon they can detonate whenever they sense that I'm getting threatening. Um, which was in, that was actually in Hurricane. That was in Hurricane. It was sort of like him going through like all of the reasons he should or shouldn't write this thing. Um, and so that was my little Gethsemane reference because I love that song. Brilliant. Brilliant. Let's take one more from this side and then we'll go to the other side. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Eva. <laughs> Hello. Um, Helpless and Satisfied are both such brilliant songs about women from a woman's point of view. Um, how do you do that? He's my dad, by the way. Oh, my goodness. So um, he, he does it too. And so, for example, in Superstar, I Don't Know How to Love Him is an incredibly beautiful song sung by a woman about, uh, you know, the, the absolute internal turmoil that she's feeling at that moment. How do you do it as a man? And do you feel at the end of it, I've really nailed what it is to be a woman? <laughs> no. You just write it like it was anybody else. That, I mean, that's the answer. You don't, pr you don't, uh, there's nothing you change. You just put yourself in the shoes of the character and you walk around and you talk to yourself until it feels true. Um, you know, I, I've said this before, but for me, the au most autobiographical songs uh, in Hamilton is that would be enough, but that's not like that's <laughs> it's really it's no, my wife's gonna kill me if I tell a story. I can't tell that story, but I um, it was you know, that was that's my love letter to my wife. You know, the as long as you come home at the end of the day, like, like what our kid is, how smart our kid is gonna be because you're gonna be the mother of my kid, um, like that feeling. Um, that's that that was just that's my shit. That's my baggage. Um, and so you just put yourself in, in the shoes of the character, and it doesn't matter what the gender is. That, that all comes out in the wash. Um, you know, I, I, I said this at closing night of, of In the Heights, is the, the secret of In the Heights is not that I feel like I'm Usnav, it's I feel like I'm Nina. Uh, I, I, Kiara and I are, were both Nina. Kiara was the first in her family to go to college, um, and uh, I, I was very much um, aware of the sacrifices my parents were making for me to be able to go to university. I mean, it was like, it was a bit, like my dad went from working in the nonprofit sector to getting a real job so that I could go to, so you know, you can't take that lightly. You can't cut class because you know your parents are killing themselves to afford it. And so that, that song, Breathe, which is, you know, that's, you know, the it was the hardest song to write and it was the last song to write, came because it was so close to home. But, but gender is sort of the least of it. Hello, just here. 
Uh, for, for the Facebook people at home, you, you project beautifully. I have the great privilege to music direct both pieces of yours, and I'm very lucky to have done so. My question is, you both have such distinctive musical voices. When you hear an Andrew song or a Lynn song, you know it's an Andrew song or a Lynn song. And I guess I want to know two things. Firstly, are you aware of that? And secondly, how did you develop your voice? What is that journey like for you as composers, and do you think you'll ever get there? Do you want to take that? Well, <laughs> hey, again, I think it's very much, it, it, you've got to get under the skin of the character of who you're writing for in the story. I mean, I obviously don't write lyrics, but I try with the, with the music very, very much to, to I, mean, I mean, let me put it another way around. You, you could have a, a great song, but it be in the wrong place and the wrong, with the wrong character and everything, and it still won't work. I mean, you could have, say, I mean, my, my favourite song of all time, I think, is Some Enchanted Evening. Uh, but you could have Some Enchanted Evening in the wrong place and in the wrong show, and it simply won't work. So I feel that you have to get under the character, under the skin of the story, and then the song will emerge. Yeah, absolutely. And I also, I don't hear it. Like, I don't hear what my own voice sounds like, but... I'll do my impression, like it's funny, you know, for me, Room Where It Happens was like my Candor and Ebb love letter. This is me trying to write a Candor and Ebb song. Um, it's very ironic and Brechtian and detached. And even the last section, uh, Click Boom, is like that jazz. Um, you know, it's a straight up yank. Um, and, you know, Candor was at, John Candor's a great friend, and he came to the workshop, and I was like, Room Where It Happens. And he was like, yeah, I don't hear it. He didn't hear it. I mean, you don't hear what you sound like. And yet, it must be true, because I remember when I wrote Neil Patrick Harris's closer for the Tonys, I didn't tell anyone I was doing it. It was like this super secret surprise that he was just going to start rapping about the evening and summarizing the evening in hip-hop. And suddenly, my phone jumped off the table while we were backstage. They were like, are you backstage? Did you write? Like, everyone could just tell. Like, all my friends just started writing me, like, you wrote this? Um, so there's something to it. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's a bit like accent, you know, like I can't hear my accent. Um, I'm sure I have one. I have a New York inflected dork accent, um, you know, but you know, my, my mother-in-law is Austrian and my wife can't hear her accent, although it sounds very Austrian to me. I mean, so you can tell a John Candace song a mile away, can't you? Yeah. I'm Fred Ebb, you know, you, yeah. I mean, I absolutely can. But if someone played you what they thought was their version of Andrew Lloyd Webber's song, you wouldn't be able to tell. You'd be like, that's what I sound like? Yeah, I, well, yeah exactly. <laughs> but it, it's kind of interesting. We, we were talking earlier, though, about how, how, how timing is also incredibly important. I mean, one of, the, yeah. one of the things I always think about musicals is, is that, and, and what happened with Hamilton and has happened, I, I, you know, to me, perhaps to a lesser extent, but... It's just when every single ingredient comes together and, yeah. it, and, and all the, the planets align. And, and it, 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 it happens very, very rarely. Absolutely. And, and it's an extraordinary thing when it does because we are not an island. I mean, you totally. rather irritatingly do rather more than I do. <laughs> uh, but, but, it, it's a, but, but I mean, I'm only a part of a team. You right. know, it's, it, the direction's got to be right. The yeah. choreography's got to be right. And Hamilton doesn't right. work without Tommy Kale. I mean, you know, like, fan, like how Prince is staging a phantom, yeah. like, that's yeah. still running on Broadway. It's not yeah. a revival. It's Hal Prince's direction of it. I mean, that's right. And with yeah. Evita, he did an extraordinary job as well. Right. I always remember Hal saying something to me which stays with me all the time. I did a dreadful musical called Jeeves. It was a disaster. Um, but I remember Don't him... Don't sugarcoat it. I remember him... <laughs> I, I, uh, well, like, I, I am, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I remember him going to see it and him uh, calling me and saying, Andrew, he said, uh, bank the score. He said, but just remember one thing. You can't listen to a musical if you can't look at it. Mm -hmm. wow. And I uh, never forgot that. And uh, I said to him, is it possible I should come and see you? And he said, well, come around and have a drink at the Savoy. And he said, what are you writing now? And I said, well, I'm thinking about doing something with Tim Rice about Ava Perron. And he said, well, please bring it to me when you finish it. Wow. And that was, that was that call that he made to me, s just encouraging me when I was really down, yeah. that led, in, led to Evita. Well, and Evita is, I mean, I don't know how many of you know <laughs> about Evita <laughs> and the staging of Evita. Like, uh, I, I, I was talking to, I was telling you, I talked yeah. to George Wolfe about it. He, George yes. Wolfe saw it eight times. It was like the master class in directing a musical. Tommy Kale has a quote, you know, if, if he had a Mount Rushmore of directors, it would be Mike Nichols and Hal Prince twice. 
Um, <laughs> and and that's I mean that's how big. But thinking of Kandra and Ebb, yeah. when Chicago started. That was the poor relation of the season. In fact, it, it didn't really work. Right, it was the same, and again, about timing, yeah. that came out the same year as Chorus yeah, Line. Chorus Line. Chorus Line was the big one. Right. And then, I, I mean, I saw the first night, funny enough, of Chicago in, in New York, and, I, and, it, and it didn't quite work. And it was then, all those years later, then it was done as an almost staged concert. That that's the Chicago we know now, isn't it? And yeah. I, I suppose, arguably, you might say you know Chicago better than Chorus Line. Right. I, yeah, and, and I always sort of that I always use that as an example of like the show is gonna find its audience. Like op like opening night, closing night Broadway is a tiny, tiny part of the life of a show. You know, there are, you know, Susical opened and closed, and Susical is the, m I'm looking at Bert Fink, who probably <laughs> runs the rights for it. It's probably the most produced student musical, like, in the world, um, mm -hmm. and has touched generations and generations uh, of students. And, and so, you know, we, we can't think of West End and Broadway as the be-all, end-all. Chicago opened and closed without fanfare in 1975, and the revival is going to outlive us all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it's, and so it's just, um, I, I'm a very firm believer of like sort of, they, f they find the audience and they find the people who, who are gonna. So do you think there's hope for Jeeves after all this time? I do! <laughs> <laughs> I do. I think we've got time for a couple more. Hello. Just down here. Lynn, hello. Um, I saw In the Heights and I was thrilled. I mean, this is, this is mostly not a question, but a huge thank you, really. Oh. <laughs> for, um, because you had done the same thing within the Heights that Andrew and Tim did with Jesus Christ Superstar, which is take the pop music of the day and put it into the theatre. And musicals had kind of not moved on since then, but suddenly, with hip-hop, you had a way of telling a story really, really quickly, because you've got a lot of words in in a short <laughs> time. So kind of you replace the book with that. And I thought, this is wonderful, we have moved on. And then I listened to Hamilton, but particularly... My grandchildren listen to Hamilton, and they know it by heart. Now, th this is a show that goes right across generations. A apart from that, they're, they're in America for a year at the moment, the grandchildren. So they're learning American history from it, which may have not have been your intention. Totally they also they know it by heart, and they identify really strongly with George III's song. <laughs> so I now have a seven-year-old grandson who walks around the house singing, I will kill my friends and family to remind <laughs> you of my love. I get a lot of that. I get that a lot. I'm sorry. Yeah. Question. Um, this started in the White House, which is a good place to open. <laughs> or terrible, depending well, on how well, the well, it could have been. Yeah, but it started in a friendly White House. Yeah. Um, imagine now. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's not what I meant, but okay. Well, you know, it, it's interesting. I mean, that, that thing you say about sort of theater, I'm going to take that part of your question because I'm fascinated by that because that is something we share in terms of we like music that exists in the world and we also love writing for theater and love bringing that into the theater. You know, it, Andrew's origin story is he saw rock music in a theater, so why shouldn't it be in a theater, you know, when you watched that natural. show. Natural. Yeah, it was, it was natural fit. You know, I, I grew up with parents who loved theater music and played it, you know, it would be... Latin music, and then they'd play a, you know, they'd play the Dirty Dancing soundtrack, and then they'd play, you know, whatever. But it was all sort of in a mix together, and so, and and there was a time when popular music and theater music were friends. You know, there's 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 Cole Porter, there's Jerome Kern, there's that was you'd go to the theater to see the song you heard on the radio performed live, and um, and so I, I, you know, I to me that only makes, you know, to me that's one of the things that continually renews hip hop as well is, is hip-hop takes anything and everything at its disposable and, and mixes it and scratches it and, and makes it new and makes it um, a, a new art form. They'll take a sample and they'll make, some, make a new meaning out of it. Um, and and I, I think musical theater is exciting when it does that too, you know. I, I was really excited when I discovered the Hedwig cast recording in college being like, these sound like they could be Lou Reed B-sides. Like it, it, like it very much honored that, you know, the, the rock aesthetic it was based on, and, um, and, and you know, and sa same with Jesus Christ Superstar, same with um, countless others, but, but that I like musicals that sound like the world we live in. Rather dumb question to you is, have you caught up with Christine and the Queens? No. Do you know what I mean by Christine and the Queens? No, what's you that? You do. Well, I went to see her at the Brixton Academy uh -huh. oh, just at the end of last year, 
and I thought it was one of the most theatrical acts I've, mm. I've ever seen. Oh, I mean, quite extraordinary. And I just wondered if she'd, she'd happened in America, because, I mean, she is very much the kind of person who it would be wonderful to lure into the other palace here and, and, and get to do a musical, because it, th 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 the one thing which is quite interesting, just to pick up something you said earlier, about the amount of time it, t it takes to workshop shows yeah. and this, that, and the other, that's something that we don't really have in our culture here s to, to that degree. I mean, there are theatres that do do it, but one of the reasons I wanted to try and open this space for people is because you know you do need to have somewhere where you can try things out and not be frightened mm. to yeah. make a bit of an and idiot And you need a for real audience. You can't, like, yeah. your friends and family are going to love what you write. So sure. like a reading is not enough. You no. need an audience who doesn't know what they're getting. And a workshop sometimes can be a bit closed because yeah. it's going to be people from the business and mm. the people around, but it's, it's quite good. I mean, when we were trying out my little school of rock show in, in New York, we, we tried it out in the Gramercy. <laughs> uh, we um, we did literally did that, uh, took a space very like this and just said, look, it's you know, $30 a ticket, come. Yeah. And I got more feedback from that by not you know, going out of town and getting involved with sets and automation and all of that. Uh, it was just great because it was just the material. And um, I, I don't know, I, I think it's really interesting what you're saying, that I, I, in the end, musical theatre's got to reflect what's going on around us. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's what's so absolutely thrilling about your work. Oh. Um, anyway. I think we've probably got time for one more, so we need to make it the best possible question <laughs> oh boy. in this room, because this is what we'll remember. Is it the best question? I think so. A lot of pressure. <laughs> There's a lot of pressure. This is. So. <laughs> Here, pass me the mic. I'll pass it to him. You're too far away. <laughs> it's a big send up this. I know, <laughs> there's a lot of pressure on this. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, first of all, just like, love you guys' work. Like, I can't <laughs> describe like, the, amount, the amount of time like, a group of us, like, before we start rehearsals, we kind of like, oh, let's just like, put on a song, and then we're like, Oh, okay, I'm, I'm Mulligan. It's like, uh, who are you? It's like, oh, I'm Eliza, I'm Eliza. Okay, okay, okay. positions, positions, like we're doing this. Like, <laughs> yeah, um, sorry. Uh, but, <laughs> Question's um, starting great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm trying to write a musical at the moment, and um, I keep, like, hitting roadblocks, and I, um, I keep, like, it can go, like, a week where I'm just like, oh, I don't know where to go with this. So, like, what's your advice on, like, finishing the hat? No, like, uh, like roadblocks like are the whole doing thing. It. Yeah, it's yeah. all roadblocks, all the way to the end. And and at a certain point, you're just going to keep writing, and you're going to write some crap. I've written a ton of crap. Um, and and what will happen is, copy your heroes, and in falling short of your heroes, you will eventually find your voice. That was sort of you know, if you listen to my early musicals, I, it's bad Jonathan Larson impressions. <laughs> um, it's me trying to write Rent and failing, <laughs> and until I sort of figured out what my voice was, and um, and then at a certain point, you realize the roadblocks are actually questions. Uh, they're not they're not roadblocks. They're this chord progression doesn't fit the scene I'm trying to write, or this melody doesn't fit the words that are in my head. And, and that's, that's sort of when you start cooking with gas. When every time you feel yourself stop writing, you go, why did I stop writing? Um, oh, it's because, and you're able to sort of really critically look at it and begin to write around it. And, and you only do that by writing. You know, I, th I think of it as like, this, I think of it as this toolbox, because I, I, you know, every song is totally different. You're not going to find a process where you suddenly start generating songs. It will never happen. Um, you will find songs that appear all at once. You will find songs where you worked for a month on two lines. Uh, my shot took me a year to write. Uh, that would be enough. took me about 45 minutes. Um, and, and that took me 45 minutes because we'd set up the moment so beautifully that I just had to be present in the moment and write it down. Uh, but my shot was all building. It was building things I'm going to pay off at the end of the show. It was establishing character, establishing Hamilton's word per minute versus Mulligan and Lord. Like, I had to establish so much. It took forever. Um, and so um, you kind of, you will reach a point where every time you stop writing or you feel like you want to stop writing, you start to question it. And then it becomes a question. And then it's not... It's not this stop sign, it's this 
question mark anyway. But that's construction as well, isn't it? Because yeah. construction is an incredibly important part of any musical. Can I ask you, you've got your story. Yeah. Yeah, you've got yeah. your story. And uh -huh. are you pleased with the outline of your story? Um, yeah, so it's based off... Um, you don't have to tell us what it's based there's a million people watching. We don't want someone to steal your idea. Yeah, <laughs> okay. okay. Oh. <laughs> it's, don't tell us what it's about. It's yours. It's all yours. So, it, so it's based off a poem that I won't say what Great. it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I kind of use the outline of that poem to like... But you've got the places where you want your songs. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Well, then it's as Lid says. It's, you know, keep thinking over in your head. What, what's the dramatic situation saying to you? And then write the song. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Go write your musical. Go write your musical. And, and bring it here to the other palace. And bring it to the other palace. <laughs> we'll work on it. And then send we it need to us. you. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Let's have one more. We've got two. Oh wow. Oh wow. Finger. This one here. Hi, I'm a big fan of both of you. I love Phantom and Hamilton so much. They mean so much. Um, I was just wondering what your... I mean, I know Phantom's been made into a movie and it was incredible. What would you feel about a Hamilton movie? Oh. <laughs> we were oh. talking about... Yeah, we, oh. we were talk, uh, you know, there's a lot of musicals I want to see made into a movie. So I'm at the end of a very long line. Come back to me when Wicked's become a movie. <laughs> Come back yeah. to me when Mormons become a movie. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a lot of great musicals in the queue. Uh, so I'm in no rush. Um, you know, that's, that's the hardest thing to do, to adapt, to adapt a, a musical into a film. I, you know, I, um, it's, it's really tough. So someone will figure it out, but I'm not going to figure it out. <laughs> I'm not going to figure it out anytime soon. Um, because because I, I don't feel in, in any rush uh, to do that. And there's, there's so many other ones that should be made before, before Hamilton gets made. But someday, who knows? You know, it took uh, Chicago Open in 1975. And then it came out as a movie in, what, 2000? Yeah, so and, and the movie is... The, I mean the and movie the movie is, yes. like, perfect. It's a perfect adaptation. And... Uh, I'll wait as long as it takes till you find the director that makes it perfect. And that's, that's, you know, and you know what, it still may not work. But, but I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm in no rush on that score because I worked really hard to make a stage piece. And so that's, that was my charge. It's gonna be someone else's charge to figure out how to adapt it. Great, yeah, cool. Wonderful. I feel like we've got a piano here and I just feel, I just feel like. <laughs> I don't know what we do, but I feel like there's a thing. You know what I'll do, since we're on the subject of new musicals? I'll play you a song I wrote when I, how old are you? 19. 19. I'll play you a song I wrote when I was 17. Oh. To show you how far <laughs> there is to go. Because this song is not very good. Um, but I wrote a musical my senior year in high school called Seven Minutes in Heaven. <laughs> What did you guys get up to in the closet for seven <laughs> minutes? That you're laughing so knowingly. Um, but it was, it was about my first chaperone. They say, write what you know. I was in 12th grade. I wrote about my first unchaperoned party in seventh grade. And um, this also gets to your question about gender, because this is a, a, a young woman named Beverly who is, is being pressured to go to this first unchaperoned party. And uh, this is the first song I wrote that I thought was any good. Um, and this is, uh, okay, so let's see here. And I haven't played it in like 20 years. <laughs> <laughs>
me. I just froze and smiled back sheepishly, <laughs> turning crimson red, the blood rushing to my head. I thought to myself, oh God, my stomach it feels strange, and my palms are all sweaty. Why do I feel more emotionally naked playing that song than doing <laughs> Hamilton? <laughs> Andrew, what was your first song? Oh, <laughs> we don't. Give us an really early one. We don't really go there, actually. <laughs> I, I, you know, I did. Uh, one, I, I, when I was about eight or nine, I, I had a bit of music published, which what? was called the Toy Theatre, and I discovered it the other day, and um, How's it to, done? to my shock horror. <laughs> there is one little bit of it that made Joseph. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and I have never told Tim this because I only discovered it the other day. But chained and bound, afraid, alone, da 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 da. That was in the toy theatre. Oh. <laughs> so I'll have to sign it and send it to you, Tim. <laughs> well, that's the other lesson: is steal from yourself as Absolutely. much as you want. <laughs> the, the, the story of tonight. Bank everything. Yeah, the story of tonight was a doo-wop song I wrote when I was 16 years old. The melody of that, because I wanted it to feel like young people writing their first song, um, and so I just cribbed from 16-year-old me. I was just like, let's take that. Um, and yeah, I find bits and bobs that I wrote years ago popping up. Do you have a kind of tune bank? Like, I surprised myself to find that it showed up. You see, I kind of do, because yeah. when I'm between projects and, uh, you know, as I'm looking for a story at the moment, any good stories, please call me. That's uh, why I didn't want uh, you to uh, tell them the poem. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> was originally in South Pacific. Oh it, was wow. called, and it was called Suddenly Lucky. Suddenly, suddenly lucky, lucky, suddenly my arms are lucky, is how it went. <laughs> and, it was, and it was the song, Richard Rogers told me this, it, it was the song, it, it, was, it was Younger Than Springtime, it's where Younger Than Springtime was. Oh wow. And Joshua Logan said it's not good enough. And so he kept the tune and it became Getting to Know You and The King and I. But just one thing actually, guys, when you're going downstairs, have a look at something. There's a poster there that Richard Rogers gave to me for a musical called Away We Go. And Away We Go was the title of a musical called Oklahoma until four days before it opened. And if you see, you'll see on the poster there, it's got Away We Go, including the songs people will say we're in love, the Surrey with the fringe on top, and just shows you the fine line between a musical working mm -hmm. or not. Would it have been a hit if it was called Away We Go? The world will never know. We will <laughs> never know. Well, awesome. Nor will we ever hear the song Away We Go either. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, it's been an absolute honour. Please yeah. join me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name's Paul, Paul Taylor Mills. I'm the artistic director here at The Other Palace. Um, the Other Palace, we are here and we're going to be presenting uh, fully produced musicals and alongside the fully presented musicals, we're also going to be doing some extracurricular activities, which is our initiatives. Um, those initiatives are designed to inspire, educate, and to give artists who really want to work in new musicals an opportunity to uh, work on those musicals. Um, tonight is the very first live at the other palace, uh, and I'm absolutely honoured to be here, uh, not only because I ran 26 miles today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But um, also tonight is really, really special because it's an absolute honour to uh, welcome two people to the stage who have been instrumental to my career. Um, first of all, please uh, help me in welcoming Andrew Lloyd Webber to the stage. Thank 
Thank you. fantastic uh, excitement for me because I guess it was February two years ago, mm. just really about February two years ago that I went to see Hamilton for the first time at the Public Theatre in, uh, in New York and I, I left thinking that for the really the first time really in the 50 odd years that I've been working in musical theatre that I'd seen something completely different, completely new, completely original, and that it was a tone of voice. I just sort of celebrated. I, I could, did, really didn't know what to say. So I did something which I've never, ever done in my life before, and have only once done uh, since. I tweeted. <laughs> 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 and I, I just said exactly that. And uh, I, I cannot tell you, therefore, what a joy it is to bring Lynn on in a moment. I just want to tell you one thing, which is why Paul's here that I've only ever been in conversation once before, and it was with Putin. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, you, may, you may wonder why this was, but the thing was is that some years ago, I got myself conned by the BBC into doing the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to the BBC, look, I'll do this, providing I can get an interview with Putin about the Eurovision Song Contest. And the BBC said, no way can you get this. So I rang up his sidekick, a guy called Dmitry Peshkov, and uh, I said I'd like an interview with Putin, what well, he was Prime Minister at the time, about the Eurovision Song Contest. And I got it. <laughs> and so uh, after, I, it was the most scary thing I've ever, ever been through in my life. <laughs> he, he had these six dogs, which he had around, <laughs> a huge, great dogs, and sort of bored me with his pale blue eyes. <laughs> so after that, I decided that a career as an interviewer was not a good idea. <laughs> so I thought Paul could help me out today and with the questions. But anyway, I'd like you to welcome that the most exciting person who to have merged in musical theatre, in my view, in 50 years, Lynn Manuel Miranda. <laughs> Well, they seem to like you anyway. That's the I, main don't, I don't know how to follow that introduction. <laughs> I can't possibly live up to it. Well, we can't really. I was going to ask you that... The <laughs> The, the corny question, which I suppose I just have to, because somebody else will if I don't. <laughs> but why on earth did you get involved with musicals as opposed to writing songs and pop songs and all that? Oh, well, uh, yeah, that's a great place to start. Um, and I'm going to ask you the same question. Now, no way should you think this is a one-way interview. Oh, I, I, I got I, questions. I was going to leave it to Paul and go home. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, I, I, I was very lucky to go to an elementary school where the capstone of elementary school, Hunter College Elementary School in New York City, and um, the sixth graders would do a musical every year. That was sort of the summation of your year, and so, and the whole school goes. So I remember seeing musicals as a part of school, like here are the first graders and we're going to see the sixth graders do Fiddler on the Roof, and in kindergarten we saw West Side Story, and <laughs> you know, it, yeah, and um, <laughs> By the time we got to sixth grade, our brilliant music teacher, Barbara Ames, had run out of age-appropriate musicals for us to do. This is before the R&H Junior series existed. She was doing bootleg versions of her own stuff. And so we did 20-minute versions of the previous six years' worth of musicals. So it was this lethal dosage. I played a son in Fiddler. I played an Out of Pearl backup in The Wiz. I played <laughs> Captain Hook. Bernardo, uh, and most importantly, I played uh, Conrad Birdie, um, and I was 12 years old and three feet tall, and <laughs> every girl in the grade had to pretend to be in love with me, and faint when I sang, and I said, I'm doing this now, <laughs> uh, and that was it. I mean, I, I, and I grew up loving, you know, I grew up, uh, my parents loved Man of La Mancha and Camelot, and I saw Phantom in sixth grade, and I went, oh, this is about a songwriter who needs music to get girls to like him. This is about me! <laughs> <laughs> um, and yep. so that was very formative. In fact, I auditioned for the sixth grade play with Music of the Night, up three octaves, because I was still a soprano at the time. <laughs> Puberty had not yet struck. <laughs> so that's how you do it. So it was literally 
at school. Yeah, it was at school. And I mean, that's really why it's so important that we keep music in, in, in our schools. Because it's, yeah, it changed a lot. What about you? Well, I mean, it was, a, it was a funny because, of course, you see, musicals, when I started in sort of 1910, uh, <laughs> were, were, were really not, and you know, they're not part of the DNA as they are in America. So I guess when I, when I started, I mean, if you said you liked Rodgers and Hammerstein, people looked at you as if you were another, from another planet. And I, I, I remember that, you know, at, every, everybody either wanted to be a beetle or, or a stone or whatever, but I kind of said, I, I like musicals, and people looked at you as if you were really rather curious. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I was kind of plowing quite a, a lonely furrow, really. Yeah. But funnily enough, though, the, the first piece of mine that ever really got started was Joseph and Amazing Totally Kind of Dreamcoat, and that was written for a school. Oh, wow. And uh, although it wasn't staged, it was written as a kind of cantata, you know, and it was, of course, telling history in a new way, which I suppose brings us on to... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. Seamless. Well, I mean, and that's really our, our shared DNA here, because when I first read Ron's biography of Hamilton, at the end of the second chapter, when I realized, oh, this is, hip-hop's the only way to tell this guy's life story, um, I said, well, then I'm, th I'm about to get my Andrew Lloyd Webber on. Um, <laughs> I will do a concept album, and I'll have rappers play the founders. And, and then the fun for me, in, re I mean, in reading the book for the first time, I, mean, I, I didn't even know the history at this point, was I'd get to George Washington and how Ron described him. i go, OK, so that's like common. Um, and I was casting <laughs> rappers and R&B artists as the founders. Like, who is the vocal fit in my conception of this? Um, even in the first time reading through it. And so, but in my head, I was, I was going to do what you did, which was make this amazing concept album and have everyone who listens to it be like, when is this going to be a stage play? Um, which is sort of what happened. But well, well we, we can, Tim Rice, I, is Tim Rice here? I think he might be tonight. What? Uh, <laughs> Hi. Uh, Just another sir <laughs> in the second row. Uh, but we s uh, sort of really were forced to do it because nobody would put our show on stage. Nobody thought the musical about Jesus Christ was at all a good idea. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and in fact, they thought we were terminally insane. Uh, but we recorded a single of it, mm -hmm. which was just called Superstar, and it got a bit of sort of traction around the world in one or two places. And as a consequence of that, the record company said, well, OK, you can have the money to make the album. So it was kind of the other way around. So you did it through the record system. So we did through the record system almost by mistake because nobody would, um, nobody would stage it. That's, that's interesting to me because I remember thinking as I was writing it, you know, how did, how did you get like the lead singer of Deep Purple and these like established rock artists like on your concept album where it's like, I didn't know any rappers. Like, I didn't know how to get the people I had in my head. I mean, thinking back on it, I think record companies were far more open yeah. to, uh, I mean, Tim Russ and I were unknown at the time completely, but I think they were sort of far more open to the idea. And in fact, Murray Head, who played Judas on the original album, had worked with Tim Rice at EMI uh, when uh -huh. Tim was working there. And so we managed to put together a cast, and Ian Gillan was a new member of Deep Curve Purple at the time. Right. And there was all this good business going on about rock fusion, and Deep Purple wrote a symphony uh, mm -hmm. for rock band and orchestra, which I don't know what ever happened with, but I mean, it, it, was, it was around. Uh -huh. And it was a kind of time when the Stones, you know, had the Bach choir on, you know, right. singles and things. And, and so everything was all coming together in a, in a very different way now. But um, I, I mean, it's the other way around to, to Hamilton, because, I mean, you, you were developing Hamilton for a long while. Yeah, yeah, I started writing that song in 2008. I was on my first vacation yeah. uh, from In the Heights when I, um, when I read that book. Um, but that's also, again, that's really fascinating to me because you're sort of describing a time when rock was branching out into other genres of music and you kind of met well, it from the other end. Everything was allowed. It yeah. really didn't matter. Yeah. You could take instruments from anywhere 
Um, I mean, the more you mix, the right. more than you mix and match, the yeah. better. And I've been this guy who's like, hip hop belongs on Broadway, hip hop belongs on Broadway. It's just kind of, you know, like the, the guy on the corner holding a <laughs> sign. Um, <laughs> And for a long time, um, because I just I, I feel like the the things I love about hip hop are also the things I love about my favorite musicals in terms of how you tell story and how you characterize those things and how much you can pack into a lyric. Um, and so um, so yeah, so I you know I, I kind of had to write the show in order to make the album. <laughs> you know, I, I went around it, it backwards. Completely the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Completely. Completely. But the other thing was, of course, we were we we had to therefore stick to the album because the album was so well known right. particularly in America that we couldn't really change anything and sometimes I know that Tim and I both wonder whether that was really a good thing because it meant that a director couldn't say could you add another 24 right. bars here for a scene change or whatever yeah it, so it became the piece that's an inter but another interesting thing we share because we also weirdly had public gestations of our show. I mean, you have yeah. the album, which exists and is well known before you ever stage it for Jesus Christ Superstar. And I performed the first song at the White House. Um, and as one does. As one does. <laughs> uh, because uh, we had been, you know, the Obamas had just been elected. They, they invited me to perform something from In the Heights. They said, unless you have something about the American experience. And I went, um, <laughs> <laughs> just started doing this, and uh, I, I sent it to Stan Lathan was the producer of the evening, and uh, he I sent him the lyrics, and he because I didn't have the music yet, I had been writing to a beat I had I had created in GarageBand, and uh, he he wrote back, oh you're closing, um, you're gonna be the closing number of of our night, uh, so I call Alex and was like we have to translate this beat I made to a piano, and uh, and performed it uh, at the White House, and then. You know, it went well in the room, and then it went, well, the, the good luck of it was HBO film that evening, because they had poets yeah, that yeah. were participating. So the footage of it doesn't look like C-SPAN footage of a White House yeah. event. It looks like I'm starring in some weird movie about my life, <laughs> about the time I got to perform for the Obamas. And it's true, if you ever made a movie about my life, you would just cut to that footage. <laughs> um, and so... Uh, so then that became, that had its own life, this one song, just like Superstar. That song... That started it. That started it, and I worked on other projects, but I was, um, I had that song out in the world, and if you look at the YouTube comments, it would always be, my teacher showed us this. We saw this in class. Oh, okay. yeah, and so yeah. I knew, we'll be fine with school groups. <laughs> <laughs> like, this show, will, this show will be fine with school groups, and like, I should finish writing it. And I was working at the glacial pace of a song a year. Um, so I, at, in 2010, when I had two songs to show for all my work, Tommy Kale, being the smarter one in our relationship, said, let's start setting deadlines. And so we just started <laughs> staging concerts. So the, first time anyone heard any other songs were at, at Lincoln Center. We, he was like, they've offered us Alexander Hamilton's birthday, you're gonna write a, as many songs as you can, that's the deadline, and I had six months and I wrote 11 I songs. I mean, how many incarnations did you have of it in workshop? Um, it, pretty fast as musicals go. I mean, it was, it was the Lincoln Center workshop for which I wrote 11 songs, and, and I got a great piece of advice from John Weidman, who, who you know, writes with yeah. Sondheim a lot, because I was drowning in the research. You know, you can write 50 musicals about Hamilton and never touch on the same thing. Um, and John Weidman said, stop worrying about it, getting everything, just write the parts you think are a musical. Um, and so for that concert, that's exactly what I did. I wrote The Affair, I wrote, the, you know, had the opening number, I had The Affair, I had Hamilton first getting to New York, I wrote two cabinet battles, I actually wrote a third one that, did, that no one's heard, um, that didn't make it because it wasn't quite good enough. Um, and I wrote Helpless. Satisfied didn't exist yet because I was still on the fence as to whether Angelica would be a character in the story or not. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I'm glad I went the way I did. <laughs> and, uh, and so, so yeah, so, but that ended up forming sort of a spine. And then I went... And then the next incarnation was Vassar, where I wrote Act One. And then we had a bunch of internal um, readings. Actually, there was a version where there were dialogue scenes between the yeah, songs. Yeah, that's, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, we worked with a really great playwright who will remain unnamed, <laughs> um, but who wrote these beautiful dialogue scenes where, you know, it would be 
talk, 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 helpless, talk, 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 satisfied. And it didn't work because the opening number is what it is. Well, I was going to ask you that because you know, listening to it again on the way here, um, I, I thought you couldn't possibly follow that number with dialogue. Yeah, you can't be like, hey, let's go to the bar. Like, it doesn't, yeah. like, <laughs> when, when it's such heightened speech at the yeah. top, it just, yeah. the ball falls. And so what ends up happening is the inverse, we have the inverse rule of musicals, which, you know, the standard trope they tell you is you talk and when it's too heightened, you sing. And when it's even more heightened, you dance. Now, in our show, you only talk when it's super important. There's two dialogue scenes in the whole show. It's um, Hamilton meeting Eliza, it's Lauren's dying, and oh, and the third one is Hamilton's soliloquy at the end. Um, and that's sort of the only time we don't have any music playing. I, but I remember years ago, um, when I first met, I was lucky enough to meet Richard Rogers uh, just after Superstar came out. And um, he asked me, I mean, I mean, I obviously was itching to ask him questions like, I mean, what was it like working with Hammerstein compared with Hart and all those sort of things. But the only thing he wanted to know was, did I think that the through song musical was going to be the future? <laughs> and I, I mean, it, it's extraordinary, really, because I remember saying to him, I think it's horses for courses. I mean, certain shows, I think you do, you've got to have dialogue. Absolutely. But I think there are, I mean, of course, I like the idea of, as a composer, being in control of the evening. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. <laughs> and, and it kind of works. Yeah, I yeah, and then, you know, when we, when we sort of reached the decision, when we did that one reading where there were dialogue scenes, you know, it, it was about two, three days of Tommy and I not calling each other, which is very weird, because we call each other when we've had breakfast. Um, <laughs> and the first thing we said to each other was, why does it feel like we stepped sideways from when we just did 11 songs in a row? Why does it feel like a step back from that? And it was, there's nothing wrong with the scenes, it's just this is not meant to have dialogue. Um, and it meant a lot more work for me, because I was really counting on being like, all right, you take this section, I'll write a song for this. You know, there is a fun in, in, in going back and forth with another writer. I really enjoy that part of the process, but it just didn't make sense uh, for this story be because of the way we'd set it up. But it's kind of interesting because Rogers was talking to me about the through song musical and everything. And I suppose the question that a lot of people would ask you is, do you feel your, you yourself will ever write outside of hip hop? Oh, yeah. I mean, all the time. I, I, I think that's, um, for me, the, the insight in, in seeing Hamilton as a story was, this is a story hip hop's uniquely suited to tell. Because of the narration. Of because the of the narration, because yeah. of the sheer amount of events in his life, and yeah. because Hamilton as a person, every major event in his life is marked by writing. And to me, yeah. my favorite hip-hop MCs are the ones who write their, you know, just write incredibly, and they write narratives about their own lives or, or sort of these characters that they create around themselves. And I thought Hamilton created himself, and he created himself through his writing, and that's what MCs do. Um, and so that was, you know, it was just sort of, this story is, is suited to my skill set. Um, yeah. And like in, and it, the book just kept proving me right as I was reading and I was like, oh, he wrote under pseudonyms. Oh, what, who does that? Rappers do that. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 <laughs> oh, his, his, his disagreements with Jefferson like created a two party system. Like it was just everything. Um, just, it kept proving my thesis. Um, and so that was, you know, but th at the same time, like you fall in love with what you fall in love with. And the story tells you what it wants to sound like. I mean, don't you find that's the case is that, yeah. You know, yes. like when you're sitting down to write a vita, um, like <laughs> when, <laughs> what does it occur? Like where where does that start in terms well of like the sound? Well, it's always a question, of a isn't it? I mean, whether you adopt to what extent you become a chameleon and you adopt the style yeah. of the show that you're actually writing. And I I I tend to do that myself, but um, which people sometimes say, well, that means he's got no style. But right. uh, I, 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 I do try and get under the skin of the story that I'm doing. Because I think probably one of the things that Hamilton triumphantly shows us is, is that a great story is vital. I mean, I've come to the conclusion now that uh, you can have uh, a great score and a bad story, and the great score can't necessarily carry it. Right. But you can ha have a, a not terribly good score and a great story and it'll work. I think a great story is vital. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah, the, um, in terms of just, I mean, 
I'm, I'm, my brain is doing a Rolodex of your shows, and I'm trying to think where to even put my finger down to ask you. Um, Starlight Express. Starlight <laughs> Express. <laughs> um, no, no, I was going to ask, I was actually going to ask about, um, <laughs> I was going to ask about Phantom, um, because you get to play in all the, I mean, it couldn't be more different from Superstar, but you also get to, like, mess around with opera and like crazy atonal opera. And those who measure went on one! Oh, well that's just, yes. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's a little conceit there because uh, my idea with The Phantom was is that he wrote music that was not of his time. So he started playing with the atonal scale, right. which you triumphantly performed there. <laughs> More than it sometimes is, I have to say. <laughs> um, but but that, was the, that was the thought there. Uh, and he also plays in 7 8 time from time to time. Hey, we, 7 8 we, we, time. We all love here. We love it. Yeah. Um, I have one song in Hamilton that is just my little secret love letter to Andrew Lloyd Webber. That's like the we. only <laughs> rap in 7 8. And it's right after the first duel. Uh, number 10, pace is fire, and suddenly we're in seven for just a second. And it's like, Bur uh, uh, Lee, do you yield? You shot him in the side. Yes, he yields. I'm satisfied. Yo, we got to clear the field. Go, we won. Here comes a general. This should be fun. What is the meaning of this? Mr. Burr, get a medic for the general. Yes, sir. Lee, you will never agree with me, but these men don't. Yeah, it's fine. Good. <laughs> and, then I, and then I get to, I survived it for about, 40 bars, and I was like, meet me inside. Back to eight, back to eight, back to eight, back to eight. <laughs> but you well, know, it's, I don't know if you're aware of this, but like in music theory class now, if you're teaching seven, eight, Angela Weber's the mnemonic. It's like, how do I count seven, eight? Can you touch, can you heal me? Christ, you must be the high priest. Dun, dun, dun. That's how I count seven, eight in my head. <laughs> well, you can do seven, eight messes of different ways. So it's a, I, I just think it's a great fun time signature because you know you yeah. can don't. You never know where that rhyme's going to land. You never know. <laughs> no, you never do. Well, look, I think we should throw it open to Let's the floor. I've, I've, I've actually got I've some questions. Enough. We're we're live on Facebook, everybody, at the moment. Hey, uh, like, 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 love, <laughs> cry face. <laughs> um, Daisy Edmondson, and I'd actually love to ask this question. This is for both of you. Can success become a straitjacket? And what happens when you have a, a Phantom and a Hamilton? Andrew, first of all, to you. You first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I guess, uh, look, I, I can, uh, you can answer it in several ways. I think one of the things, and I'm sure you would agree, is, is that we're very lucky that we're doing the one thing that we love. And uh, I, therefore, don't really, it, it sounds a silly answer this, but I don't really care in one sense. I, I, I mean, after I did uh, Phantom, I did a musical called Aspects of Love, which was about a, a small number of people, and it was so different, it, and because I just wanted to do that. And I think providing that you stay true to the writing what you want to write, and, and I, I, I don't think it is necessarily a straitjacket, but of course it can be. I mean, I, I remember one thing um, um, as I'm foolishly writing my autobiography at the moment. What? And uh, I, 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 came, uh, I came across something which I'd completely forgotten about, which was that I was the cover story on t of Time magazine in 1984. And I remember thinking, when I, at the time, and I got my notes on this, thinking, I don't need this. I really, really don't need this. I'm, I'm a Brit. I'm not part of um, the Broadway community. It's going to make things very difficult for me. And I remember thinking then uh, that, it, yeah, it can be a bit of a straitjacket. But I think providing you stay true to what yourself and what you want to write, and you write next what you actually want to write, uh, rather than what you think you should write, then I think... Was there a clear a moment for you where you thought, wow, my life is never going to be the same again? Was there a, a show or a moment where you thought, wow... I don't know. I, I sort of so much just love musical theatre. It never sort of occurred to me that there was anything different mm. much. I mean, it's quite interesting, going back to something we, we were talking about earlier, but it, it's, I suppose what it's your first memory of what theatre really sticks with you, doesn't it? I mean, I remember when I was a kid that there was a show on, on British television called Oh Boy, and it was a pop rock show uh, directed by a guy called Jack Good, who did the Rock Othello among various other things. And it was done from the old Hackney Empire, and it was rock performers... British rock performers, but staged in an old Victorian theatre. And I was like nine years old, and I thought, that's what musical theatre is. <laughs> in exactly the same way as I thought Rodgers and Hammerstein were musical theatre, or West Side Story was musical theatre. And I, we were talking about that earlier. You have a very similar 
Well, yeah, I mean, I d I've been, I'm always just drawn to music that tells stories, and so genre is fluid. Genre is what clothes the person wears to the gig and what instruments they use. But a good melody is a good melody, good beat's a good beat, a good story is a good story. That's universal and that transcends. Um, and so I, 